He's the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Those words from the book of Colossians, um, they are one of the most um, concise and succinct and yet all-encompassing um, and powerful descriptions of Jesus that we have in, in all of Scripture. Um, Paul just delivers this, this really tight but just... Um, almost beyond description display of the fullness of, of who Jesus is. And that's the text that we're going to be studying this morning, but it's, it's really driving the entire message of the book of Colossians. And so we thought that as a church, one of the things that we wanted to encourage as a part of this series is, is for us to memorize this together um, in our homes, as individuals, as families, whatever it is, to, to begin to commit these verses to, to memory. So I'm gonna, we're going to start today. So let's, let's read this collectively out loud together with me, will you? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All right, great start. Um, we, we want to encourage you, as I said, as a family, to commit these, these words to memory, and I think you'll see over the course of of what we're gonna be talking about today when we have a solid foundation, a solid understanding of who Jesus is. It, it, it guides, directs our lives towards his kingdom and his glory and his purpose. And that's so much of what Paul wants to communicate here. And it's interesting when we look at, at Paul's conversation, the, the motivation in his letter to the Colossians he is really in a, a debate of sorts about who's the greatest. Like, who is the greatest of all time? There's warring sort of philosophies and ideologies. And so Paul's going to direct them towards Jesus, which th is, this is a conversation that we have culturally in different areas all the time, right? Sports fans love to debate who, what is the greatest sports dynasty in history, right? Some people would tell you it's the Patriots. Those people don't love Jesus, but they would try to <laughs> make that argument. Like, uh, if, if maybe if you've been around for a while, you would talk about, like, the Yankees from 1949 to 1956, and you could certainly make a compelling argument for that. Basketball fans might, might point you to uh, the John Wooden-led UCLA Bruins, right, where they won, I think, uh, 10 or 11 national championships. Uh, I think it was 10 in 12 years. But then other basketball fans would say that's nothing in comparison to what the U, uh, women's UConn basketball team has done. Where since 1994-95 season, I think they've won 12 national champions and they were in 18 of 19 final fours in college basketball, which is just remarkable, a dominance of, of a level that we can hardly wrap our heads around. Obviously, the answer is the 90s bulls that were led by Jordan. That's the, the correct answer. We do this with food, too, right? Just this last week, I was traveling out in, in California, and somebody found out that I was from the Chicagoland area, and the very first question they asked me my, was my opinion about pizza, right? And so I affirmed to them that Chicago-style pizza is the greatest pizza in the world, and and then, but really what they wanted to know is of the Chicago-style pizzas, like which is the best Chicago-style pizza, and I gave them my whole theory about how when you're new to it, you kind of go towards like a Giordano's or something like that, but when your tastes really develop and you become seasoned in Chicago-style pizza, you end up at a Lou Malnati's, um, <laughs> something in that direction. 
We do this with politics. We do this in, in all sorts of areas of our lives where we argue and debate, and it's all around the question of de determining supremacy, right? Who is the greatest? Who is at the top? So last week as we began this series, we, we started to look at the book of Colossians as it relates to Paul addressing some questions regarding salvation and sufficiency. There's people in Colossae who are asking themselves the question, is Jesus enough? And Paul's speaking directly into that, and he's going to make the case, and he's going to present the evidence that when you lay Jesus against all other options and against all other possibilities, all other deities and religions and rituals and worldviews, he's saying he, he begins his letter by establishing the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. He's at the top. He, he, he is the only one who can ultimately accomplish what we need him to accomplish on our behalf. If you remember when Pastor Brian was teaching last week, he, he talked about how Paul's writing this letter to a group of people uniquely that he has never met. Um, there's no record or evidence that Paul's ever been to Colossae. In fact, it, it appears that um, a, a man by the name of Epaphras from the text started the church in Colossae, proclaimed the gospel there, and has been leading it. Now he is visiting Paul, likely in Rome, while Paul is in prison, and he's giving him an update about how things are going in Colossae, in this city. Um, and, and he says, on the one hand, there's just some such encouraging things. Their faith in Jesus is, is so real, and their love for each other is just this tangible expression of the gospel, but he also has some concerns. Epaphras shares some concerns with Paul, some pressure that these, these Christians are facing that surround them and, and their culture, which again is, is amazingly relevant to the world that we live in. He's describing how the, the, the philosophies that surround them are beginning to infiltrate or inter intermingle with the message of the gospel, and as a result, People are starting to adapt a version of the gospel where Jesus and Jesus alone isn't enough. Now remember, a, a lot of the community in Colossae would have grown up in the practice of and worship of the Greek and Roman gods. And so there's some who, they're just looking at this message about Jesus and their, their idea is we'll sort of add Jesus to the pantheon of of these other gods, his message is good, we'll just add him along. And then Brian talked about how the, the Gnostic philosophy was coming in, that one of its foundational elements was distinguishing between the spiritual and the material, and how the spiritual is, is where everything good and pure and holy lies, and the material is by definition evil. And, and so you add Jesus into that sort of worldview, who, who is, humanity who carries flesh and at the very least your understanding of Jesus then is that that his his goodness his holiness has been corrupted by by the material so there has to be something more and then there's Jewish background believers when they're hearing the gospel some of them so we see this throughout the New Testament some of them have kind of fallen into a trap of Jesus and the Torah, obedience to the Torah. So yes, Jesus, and yes, the gospel, but eat a kosher diet. Or, or let's make sure that we maintain circumcision. Or, and so Paul is, is speaking all of these into these different worldviews, and he wants to boil it down, and he wants the church to understand from the very outset, Jesus is everything. J Jesus is, is in this, Paul in this poetic form is going to teach the Christians in Colossae and, and to the church today that Jesus needs nothing added. He needs nothing taken away because he is all that they need. He's all that we need. So Paul's words here in, in Colossians chapter 1, they are a, a hymn or a confession of the early church. And they're this powerful articulation of who Jesus is of what Jesus has accomplished, and, and finally, who we are in Jesus. And I, I'll tell you, just as a bit of a disclaimer here, we, we are only going to scratch the surface of, of these few verses, because there is so much depth in Paul's description of Jesus that we, we would be here for 
weeks, but, and yet doing that, I hope, and again, the, sort of the purpose of us memorizing this together is that we continue to come back to this into a fuller and deeper understanding of Jesus. So let's begin by looking at Colossians chapter 1. We'll go back to the verses that we read out loud together, and I'll uh, add a few to it. And I'm going to read this, but instead of reading it, uh, the pronoun, I'm going to read the name of Jesus when I read this. It won't be that way on this screen, but I, I want us to hear it this way this morning. For the Son, Jesus, is the, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Jesus all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything Jesus might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile himself to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven. By making peace through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. See, let's begin by looking at Paul's description here of who Jesus is. Of who Jesus is. I, uh, last fall, I was out in my backyard kind of doing like that last fall cleanup, getting the last of the leaves, putting a few things away. And it had been kind of wet outside and I was walking down the steps of my, my deck when I slipped and just totally bit the dust, you know? And as I was going down, I, I tried to kind of reach out to grab myself and my shoulder just yanked, you know? So a, a day later, so I was like, I, I'm gonna have to go to the doctor. Like this is, it was really sore and I was concerned if I had torn something or whatever and I went and like many doctor's offices, when you get there, there's multiple doctors that work in that office. So I wasn't sure who I was going to see. I think I just signed up for the first availability and, and went in and the doctor that walked in was new. I didn't recognize her. And when she walked in, she looked like she was 12 years old. <laughs> like, like just maybe on a good day had graduated from high school. And I, I, I can tell you that in that moment, I was like, is this, is this person qualified to diagnose like what is going on in me? Like, is this, does this person have the experience? Like, what are your credentials? How do I know that you have what it takes in order to do what I'm asking you to do? How, how do I know that I can trust this person to accomplish what I'm here for? So this is, this is where Paul starts his, his, his argument, his debate, his description of who Jesus is. Last week he talked about, Pastor Brian talked about Paul's prayer for the Colossians. That they would be, they would grow in their wisdom and their understanding of Jesus. This is what he desires for them and he knows this is what they need to know. So in light of that, he follows this prayer with this powerful description of who Jesus is. And, and when we think about this from the men and women living, receiving this letter for the first time 2,000 years ago, we think about the culture that they, they live in, the, the importance of what Paul teaches here, the significance that even reigns truer. Because this, this culture is just surrounded by all of these, these Greek and Roman deities and mythologies. They all had their own sort of creation narratives. But rather than what they specifically created themselves, their stories were about them being created. And, and Paul says, but, but Jesus is the eternal God, the one who is without beginning, and the one who himself does the creating. See, in a culture where men and women believed that there were these various gods who were in kind of in constant conflict with each other and their efforts to consolidate power and to grow in their own influence, Paul describes Jesus as the one who is the firstborn over all creation. That's an that's a Old Testament phrase. It, it represents, it, it's a royal status. Paul is, is saying this is who Jesus is. He's king over creation because he is the one who created. Because he's creator. 
For in him all things were created, Paul writes. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and all things have been created for him. See, Paul is saying Jesus isn't one God among many, but rather Jesus is the full character and purpose of God that is embodied in human form. N.T. Wright, when he's describing Paul's words here, He says, the one through whom the world has been made has now become, as a human being, the one through whom the world is ruled. And they are the same loving God. See, Jesus, according to to Paul, he is both the author and the king of creation. So Paul here, he he is setting Jesus apart from all other deities and philosophies and powers and authorities by establishing that Jesus is the fullness of God. So in his description of Jesus. Jesus isn't there just representing God. He's not there just speaking on behalf of God. Jesus isn't partly God. Jesus is not one God among many. Jesus, Paul writes, is is the one true God where all power and authority and wisdom are contained in him. All things, he writes, have been created through him and for him. And and Jesus doesn't shy away from this. In the Gospel of John, multiple times, Jesus Jesus articulated this same fact about himself. In John chapter 10, he simply says, I and the Father are one. Later in, in John chapter 14, he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, it's obvious that that you and I, we live in a very different culture, a very different time frame. Um, But the implications of what Paul is teaching on the supremacy of Jesus, this remains as, as relevant and as necessary for us as followers of Jesus as it did for the Christians in Colossae some 2,000 years ago. Because make no mistake about it, we we live in a world where there are competing ideologies and authorities and worldviews or what Paul refers to as as patterns of this world in the book of Romans. And each of them are seeking to claim authority in our lives. Each of them want to have final say about what we do and what we value. Sometimes it's, it's incredibly subtle, almost indistinguishable. And other times it is, it is overt and obvious, but either way, it is always there, right? Whether it's the radical individualism that teaches us that, that I alone have the final say on what I determine to be good or not good or true or untrue, whether it's, it's, it's the, the materialism that we can soak in as a culture and we can look at greed and the constant pursuit of more and we'll call it ambition or security. It takes a million different forms and it comes at us in a million different ways, but there's always competing entities that want to claim authority in our lives. I was thinking about this this week and just processing what, why Paul is, is teaching so passionately here. I was thinking about moments in my life when I, I find myself struggling to live in obedience to Jesus. What is, what is at the heart? What is at the source of that? And oftentimes when I find myself in that place and I'm trying to deal with why I'm struggling so much, what I'll discover, and it takes time usually, is that I have adapted one false idol, false uh, authority, inferior authority in my life. And and in doing so, I've, I've diluted the authority of Jesus in my life. I've just sort of made him one one option among others. But in in contrast to that, when I am operating out of a sense of who he is, when when I am consciously aware of the fullness of Jesus, that that Greek word fullness can be translated uh, saturated. When when I understand that, that Jesus is soaked up, he is the entirety God throughout, When I understand that all authority and power ultimately reside in him, the only reasonable response to me, if I'm living in awareness of that, is surrender. It's it's submission. And not, again, not in like this defeatist sort of way. It's it's worship. It's like when I get it, that 
My only reasonable response in that moment to live in awareness of that is, is surrender and worship to him. So whatever it is, if it isn't, if it isn't Jesus and only Jesus, then we've settled for something less, something inferior, and, and really ultimately something false. So Paul's message to the Colossians and to the followers of Jesus everywhere is don't, don't fall for it. He was saying you were created by Jesus. You were created for Jesus and all authority and power resides in him because he is fully God. Paul goes on then and, and he begins to describe not only who Jesus is, but what Jesus has done, what he's done or, or what he has accomplished. If you look again at the second stanza of this poem that Paul writes, verse 18, he says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Um, I can show you a picture. This is a, a, a drawing that was done of Michelangelo. Um, and, and you and I can look at this picture and we can draw some conclusions about who Michelangelo was or um, we can read some of his story and understand more about him and there's value in that and that is good. But how do most of us perceive or understand who Michelangelo is? By what, he, by what he's done, right? This second picture is, is of the Sistine Chapel, just, a, just one small, has anybody here ever seen the Sistine Chapel live? Like it's, it is a breathtaking experience. And, and when you take this in, when you're standing and looking at what he ultimately accomplished, your awareness and your understanding of his ability and, and what he was capable of is, is taken to whole other levels. Right? And, and Paul makes this same point. There is a progressing logic that Paul's developing regarding our understanding of Jesus. And, and he's already now established the credentials of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. But he builds on that by helping us understand what he has accomplished. And again, when we, when we think about this from the perspective of those who are living in the time of Paul's writing and who are reading this letter collectively in the church, and you compare this to the, the narrative of the pagan gods that they were so familiar with, right? What, what did they accomplish with their power and their authority? What, what was the end result of that? More often than not, if you read those mythologies, they're just, they're just competing with each other in order to accumulate more power and more authority for themselves. And humanity really just becomes this kind of this pawn and in a cosmic struggle. The output or the accomplishment that result of these mythologies really is, is for them. But not with Jesus, Paul writes. In the case of Jesus, we're not pawns in a cosmic power struggle, but you and I are the benefactors of a benevolent God who loves us. So Paul is saying we are the, the recipients of what Jesus has accomplished. So Paul says that this, this creator God, the one who spoke life into being, the one who, who spoke all of existence and put it into its place, this God who at the very outset put it all together, this is the same God who creates new life in us. The creator God is the one who recreates. And all of this, now Paul's saying, this is only possible, right, if we understand who he is. It's all, it, this is only doable if the one who is doing this is the fullness of God. But Paul continues to develop this, this logic. He says that, that he is the firstborn from among the dead. This redemption, this restoration of God's creation so that in everything it says he might have supremacy. Do we see what, what Paul's doing here? Right? How, 
How do we know that everything that Paul just said about Jesus being the fullness of God, how he's the firstborn over all creation, how do we know it's true? What, what, what is the evidence for it? Paul says it's the resurrection. He is the firstborn from among the dead the one who conquered the grave. Any one of us can claim anything about ourselves or about somebody else, but but Paul says that Jesus publicly validated this when he rose from the dead and when he conquered the grave. It's the validation of what Jesus said about himself and what Paul's been laying out to us here. So, So it's because of this, because of who Jesus is and what he's done then, because of this victory in the grave that there is ultimately reconciliation and that we can dwell with God, that we can once again live in the presence of God. What was lost when sin entered the picture all the way back in Genesis chapter three, where humanity was designed, created to be in relationship with God. But when sin entered the picture, there was brokenness in that relationship because sin can't be in the presence of God of a holy God. Jesus, how now through his life and through his death and through his resurrection, he's brought all things back into new creation. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. This is why Paul, when he's describing the church and, and to, the, to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. Then finally, there is this, this third and yet vital component to what Paul wants to teach us about, about Jesus, and that is simply who we are in Jesus. Who we are in Jesus. At the beginning of the second stanza that I just wrote, Paul notes that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And, and I, don't, I don't wanna miss this because Jesus has gathered to himself this community of new creations called the church who are the living and breathing evidence of God's reconciling work of Jesus. And then beyond that, who are the agents of that same work of reconciliation to, to the people of Colossae and to the people of Batavia and Geneva and St. Charles and Sugar Grove and Aurora and Elburn and wherever you came from today. How do you think about, when, when we think about this, what, for most people, what is their experience of what's the evidence that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead? Right? There's, there's definitely people who will go and study the historical evidence for the resurrection. Absolutely. I, I encourage you to do that. It's compelling stuff. But for most people, in my experience, they become convinced of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done when they encounter one of his new creations. They, they, they ultimately discover the story of Jesus through the people of Jesus. So Paul goes on to write now. In Colossians 1, he says, this is verse 21. He says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, right? Paul never seems to pull any punches. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard, and that's been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. See, Paul here is is moving this from something that is a a big scale understanding of what who God is and what He's done, and he's driving it into the personal. When I was a kid, I, um, you know, you, you learn about love through watching the people around you and you learn about romantic love. And when you're a kid, like it, it, the whole thing kind of grosses you out a little bit. And like, but, but generally like my experience with that is what I saw on TV or what I saw in a movie or really mostly by what I saw from my parents. Right. And dad would come home and go hug mom and they'd be snuggling and you're just kind of like doing the eye roll thing like okay like 
And, and, and then I grew up and, and you began to learn more from other people and other places. But, but the fullest, my, my understanding of love was transformed when I fell in love. When I met Sherry and when I wanted to commit my life to her and when I wanted to do everything, right, then this, it moves from theory to what I've seen unfolding in the lives of other people to, to, to my story, right? So now I'm doing all the gross things to, to bother my kids and because it's, because it's my story. See, this is, this is what Paul is saying to the church here. In verse 21, Paul shifts the focus from this sort of this cosmic understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done, and he makes it personal. This isn't just a story, Paul says. It's your story. He says, you were once alienated from God, but now you've been reconciled by Christ's physical body. And I think, listen, for you and I, it's vital that we do not lose sight of this. Because the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus, these aren't just theoretical or theological ideas that we need to understand. Paul here is poetically and powerfully laying out in this letter, not only so that it will be understood in a corporate sense, but, or an idea that we wrap our heads around, but rather to understand that who Jesus is and what he has done is experienced in our own lives, that this is, that this is our story. It's the story of everyone who has trusted Jesus with their lives. He's saying Jesus isn't just an awesome person who's done an awesome thing. He's saying Jesus is an awesome person. He's the fullness of God who's done an awesome thing, and he's done it for you. He's done something awesome for you, Paul writes. If you're here and and you're still trying to wrap your head around who Jesus is and why we gather and why we worship him and what all of this is about, please hear me on this. I, I, I want you to understand that what Jesus took on flesh to accomplish, the fullness of God becoming one of us, his intent and his desire is to fulfill the purpose of of reconciling you to the Father through his sacrifice and through his conquering of death and sin. And all of that. And he does that when we place our faith and trust in him for the forgiveness of sins. And he's done it for you. It's who who he is and what he's done. So it's for this reason when Paul's writing the church in Colossians, he says, Jesus is enough. He says, don't add anything to him. You don't need to take anything away because who he is and what he's done. And that reality, that truth is going to shape the rest of this letter that Paul is going to write. It will always come back to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity just to, um, to again, focus our hearts and our minds around the reality of who you are and what you've done and that you've done it for us. So let the, the sole truth of that direct us and reorient our lives back to your kingdom and your purposes that we surrender and submit to you in an act of worship. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.